you feel you haven't been introduced to our leader, Kurt Collier, uh, uh, Kurt will uh, speak to us now and give us things to reflect on. And uh, du probably during it and after it, uh, we'll, be invite, we'll invite everyone to uh, um, say what they got from what Kurt has to say. Internet, you, want to, you don't have to. Oh, just the. Oh yeah. Okay. Only if you want to. Yes, I do want to. And uh, Kurt, since May of this year, has been the appointed leader of our Bergen Ethical Society. Over the years, he served three ethical societies: St. Louis, Riverdale Yonkers, and the New York Society. He's also the consulting leader of the Silicon Valley Ethical, ethical Society. So his ethical reaches spans an entire continent, and the founder of the Austin Ethical Society. Kurt was also a former instructor at the Humanist Institute. Until this past spring, he was the director of a major environmental nonprofit for 15 years, and still serves as a consultant for the National Park Service, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and various nonprofits. Kurt has degrees and certifications in philosophy, science, and counseling. For several years, he's taught college at three, di at three different universities. His research on engaging young adults in science careers was presented before Sigma, how do you, Xi? That's from the X is a Z, okay, Sigma Xi, the Science Research Honor Society, and the American Academy for the Advancement of Science. He's an advocate of ethical biocentrism which explores how humans can partner with nature to experience the possibilities and wonder of life. Kurt is a single father of a son, Andy. And here's Kurt. There we go. Um, you know, I um, am sitting here sweltering in November, whatever the date is here, um, which always reminds me that something is out of whack. Uh, it should not be this way, as we know. And it's part of what drives me to be a, our ethical biosyndrome is to figure out uh, how we include that. Uh, I've been consulting leader with the Ethical Society of Silicon Valley now for a year and have been going out there every single month, which is kind of sad for an environmentalist as I fly across the landscape watching it rip a hole through the ozone layer on my way there, but also to uh, kind of happy to spend some time with them uh, helping to build up that community which continues to grow. So I've been a busy little beaver. That is a very unique place, I have to say, Silicon Valley. It's, has anyone been there? It's this place of contradictions, to be sure. Uh, on their society is one of the major animators for Pixar films. There's one of the major engineers for the Apple iPhone. Uh, almost everyone in their entire society works somehow in the industry. An average home like you'd see over here, and these homes are, are quite nice and, and pricey, these homes would be $4 million in Silicon Valley. And one of the leaders, we went, to, uh, the president there, we went to his house, and he asked me, I was said, how pricey is it? He said, we had our house appraised because we're thinking of leaving. This is an average home like this, $4 million. And yet, as you drive down the street, you see all these people and all these RVs and all of these things parked on the side of the road, vans, RVs. And those are people who cannot afford to live in a $4 million home, but want to live in Silicon Valley and who line the streets for miles living inside of their vans and cars and RVs and things like that. So not quite homeless, but certainly can't afford to live in that area. Truly an area, of, a place of contradiction, very, very pretty part of, ca of California, uh, very green and lovely and lush. Uh, and all of these beautiful parks that all this uh, great wealth has been amassed in that area has allowed to share. So it's definitely worth visiting alongside 
poverty uh, like you haven't seen in other parts of the United States as well. A pure contradiction of extremely bright people and people who were probably equally as bright but never had the same opportunities, the same access, the same education, and therefore struggle to make it uh, just to survive in their own hometown. A very weird place to be. So I've been trying to figure out to wrap my head around this community, which in so many ways seems so artificial, right? It's, it's an accumulated wealth that has appeared in one spot, uh, unbelievable amount of wealth. There's the headquarters of Google, Apple, iPhones, you name it, NVIDIA, all these corporations piled upon, piled upon, piled upon in one area in this huge place of all these extremely uh, creative talent. And then uh, people who take buses to work, specialized buses that pick them up at the house. Uh, they are served lunch and dinner so that they don't have to go home. Uh, and of course, then uh, fake Buddhist monks come in and offer kind of versions of the Buddhist texts that real Buddhists get upset about uh, for co-opting co their religion to try and get them to find a way to work harder, be smarter, and then zone out from the whole thing. Uh, very interesting place. Also some very, very lovely people. Uh, and to have conversations with them, just extremely smart people. A lot of them from around the world who got caught up in this wonderful sense of technology using intelligence that they had and to try and make it work. So my talk is, how do I, what do I say to that group of people and to think about what's going on there? And the more, they're very much into the Silicon Valley culture and they read about it and they talk about it. That's part of what they try and expand. What's the technology? It is this remarkable place. And uh, they've had some pretty good speakers and we've read some really good books to try and figure out. And then I started to think about myself after a year of what I see about this and realized to the extent that Silicon Valley plays such a huge role in uh, ethics worldwide. And I'm gonna tell you kind of why that is. First, I want to introduce a topic, a, a concept to you. You may have heard, but maybe really never thought about or did much, called a meme. Does anybody know what a meme is? You hear this term get dropped quite a bit. You've heard the term about. You want to take a shot at What's a meme, Paulo? <laughs> uh, well, it goes back to uh, this meme. Uh, it's Exactly it. Say it again for the now for the studio audience. I'm so sorry those online. Yeah, so it's like basically like you know, like take your version of a meme and kind of like you know package it inside this like bigger meme. That's that's exactly it. So we as a species, of course, like all other species, pass on information through our genetic code, which has allows us to adapt to the or it has allowed over the years to us to adapt to the spaces we allied. But we have this special gift as uh, as a species of uh, being able to transfer information outside of our genetic code, called a meme. And so any kind of bits of information or things that we transmit is that that's why they came up with the term meme. And, and that word gets bandied about in lots of different ways. And it could be you've watched about 10 cat videos. Uh, there's a meme to them as well. But it's cultural information that gets passed on. And that cultural information is extremely powerful, and it's allowed us as a species to do things that other species cannot. We are the niche building species. We can go into, uh, the niche is the role that you play in an environment, right? We can go into any habitat and take on a role and play it in that environment uh, that other species could not uh, do or adapt to. And we do that not just because we have the genetic ability to do that. I mean, we're, we're really, look, no claws, no sharp teeth, can't run fast, losing our hair, all this kind of stuff that happens to us, but we have this, this ability to transfer information between each other in ways that other species do not. Uh, the closest that gets to us is which animal? Dolphins and crows, so they're, you know, they're closest to us, uh, that they can share information, but still we are the best at doing it. And we do that because we can tr transfer information through language, through communication, and that's how uh, we've survived and how we thrive as a species. 
Now, along the way has come technological advances that allowed people to, to then do that. If we had been ancient Greeks thousands of years ago, we would have gathered at the Teatron, literally the seeing place. We would have stood together in the theater, and we would have read together or chanted together our our, our cultural history, our roots, we would have told the stories collectively together in the same place, the Teatron, for which we get the word theater, and we would have done that kind of thing until eventually a couple of people who were really good at it would have stood in groups of three because no one was allowed to play one character because it represented the, the culture, not the individual. And they, those three would chant, often with a chorus standing behind them, and eventually they would wear masks so that we understood that it was not the individual, it was the culture that was being transmitted, and that, of course, is the roots of modern theater. Over the years, of course, we've gotten better and better at cultural transmission. Think about it. She's reading a piece of music written in what, 1600s? Bach, when was that? Uh, reading a piece of things with a bunch of notes transcribed on some lines, and from that she can unlock Bach's mind and be able to, to transmit this thing to us, which is as beautiful today as, as if we had heard it a thousand years ago. And so to a certain extent, we've always been able to do this, to be able to use these kind of memes and traditions and cultural transmission to, to infect the, uh, that kind of stuff. One of the biggest things that have come up that used to have set cultures worldwide, though, was what? What was the first thing to come along that really upset cultures worldwide? The television, because now, or in the movies, because now you could come into a person's home and show a complete different culture. And in fact, if you look at many of the kind of Wars even up into the 70s and 80s were because other cultures said, I don't want to us to live like that. Look at those people and how they're living their lives in that place. They're coming into our house, into our buildings, into our teatrons, and are telling us what is important. The, the, the Iranian Cultural Revolution was exactly about that, right? The Western satanic culture that was coming into the homes and destroying that. And I love the fact that, what's that idiot in Russia? Uh, Putin, that's his name, uh, is doing the same thing, that people are coming into our households as Western culture, and these gay people are up there talking to you on Sunday mornings, and they're destroying our thousand-year-old Russian culture, right? And so we have these kinds of things. Uh, and that has always been the case in the movies and things like that. I was in Bangkok with my parents. We were traveling uh, through, the, through the east. It was extremely hot and humid, kind of like it was here today. I could see my parents were sweltering. And I saw that there was a local movie theater, and it said air conditioning. And it was playing the movie Shrek. And I told my parents, let's go in and go see Shrek. It's very, very funny. We walked into this nice, cool, dark theater, sat down, and then had to stand up for the, for the national anthem of Thailand then the, with the picture of, the, of, the, of their king. And then we all had to sit down again. They promptly fell asleep, and I watched Shrek. Now, I'm a fan of Shrek. Seen the movie before, thought it was funny, liked it. You have grandkids, you've probably seen it, pretty funny. Uh, and then I realized, what the heck's going on? Are they skipping parts of the movie? And then it dawned on me, the movie was being edited, right? Censors had come in and cut out the things that the, the Thai people thought that were offensive to their culture. Uh, jokes and things like that were missing. Uh, and whole scenes were missing from the movie. And I realized that. And what an ability that was have always been to have something that gets transmitted through a camera or through a picture or something like that for them to come in and edit that particular scene out. So once again, that doesn't happen. Until new technologies come along, the new technologies that are all of you are carrying probably right now, that allows you to hook directly to a satellite, sometimes without uh, uh, any kind of uh, editing or moderation from the other people, that kind of stuff, to communicate directly with you instantaneously with you. You can go right now, and I don't recommend you do it, but you can go right now. Uh, there are channels uh, from Ukrainians and from others, and you can actually see the video footage from the drones as they drop bombs on the Russian soldiers. Think of that. You can go right now and see the image of a drone in another culture fighting a war with, with another person with that instantaneously without filter, and it's pretty amazing that we have that, that capability of doing that. So there are many ways in which this new technology has been pretty disruptive. 
And I want to just test this audience to see how much you think about this. In what ways have cell phones and, and social media been disruptive in the last few years? Can you think of, and you use the microphone if you could. Yeah, one, one way that I can think of is that it tr transmits lies. So along with truth, um, a lie gets halfway around the world be tr before truth gets its boots on in the morning. And that's one of the interesting things, and I'll let you be the person who walks yeah. around the room. Uh, one of the interesting things about cultural memes is they do not have to be factual. They're only pieces of culture, whether people believe them or not. But now people can say it's not even the culture, it's just what I believe. Someone sitting in Dubuque, Iowa, on their front of their uh, you know, 17 year old person could be on a computer zoom, uh, goop, uh, zoom bombing us and coming in or putting things out there and impacting our culture. Others, what are the other ways have the technology impacted us today? Uh, I can yeah, wait, wait. Yeah, use the mic. Uh, use the mic. Yep. Uh, there was a movie called Wag the Dog. Wag the Dog. Yep. And they invented a war. And so it was, a, it was an example of that kind of thing. Yeah. They were aware that technology was coming that could shape, and we, memes did not even have to be true, and you could influence uh, the entire country. Other ways that technology is impacting us today that you've been thinking about. Thank you. Certainly influencing children at a much younger age, uh, seeing things maybe not understanding them, not having a conversation within, you know, the larger family. Yeah. I mean, your, your grandkids, your kids, your grandkids have access to stuff you never would have had access to, uh, you know, until you left the Army or whatever. And, uh, and that stuff is out there today. Do we have anybody from the... Uh, Anyone on Zoom want to come in? Eric. Oh, I'm the only one so far. Uh, hopefully others will uh, raise their hand. But I'll, I'll say I think one of the things that I've noticed is that we're really, we're, we're trying to drink out of the fire hose now. There's so much more information um, and it's so much more difficult to filter, filter it um, that I think we've become more subject to the confirmation bias. Uh, and I think that's, it, it, so even though there's so much more information, I don't think we're really broadening what we're able to uh, integrate or uh, absorb. Right, people can't tell the difference between the lies and the truths, and so they tend to look for sources that they trust, which is that confirmation bias, which in a way narrows the amount of information because there is so much out there. Do you have other people? Diana in front of you, Susan, and then Joelle. All right. I, um, I think it's like the, the equalization of message. Uh, it's equally urgent to answer your phone, no matter whether it's spam or it's your mother-in-law or whatever. The demand on your attention and time and the demand on your filter is very, very strong. And people are, uh, even if you try not to, you're compelled to answer that phone whenever it should ring. <laughs> Do uh, two more in the room and then one online. Susan and then Joel? Okay. Uh, that looks like Terry. Or Alan, no. who is it? Ken and Terry, or Ken? Yep. Hi, it's me who is going to talk. Um, I noticed most of the comments so far is are kind of negative about social media, and uh, just to be a contrarian, um, but also as part of the communications committee, I always want to put a plug in that this is the way the world communicates now, and to the extent that we're afraid of it or don't understand it or think it's evil. We're just not part of the conversation. So we should be part of the conversation. Uh, we should have our ideas out there. So we shouldn't be like always negative about it. It's a tool. So right now, Ken and I are traveling. We would not have had the idea or the ability to do what we're doing without social media. I first got the idea that this was a possibility on a site called Reddit. I mean, how, you know, Reddit is the sixth biggest site in the world, but probably many of you don't even know it's there, but it's just a tool. Just like you could go to the opera or you could go to the, you know, the, the lowest form of entertainment in your city. That's what the internet is. That's what social media is. 
you see need that. And this is not a critique of the, it's just saying how much is it impact of us, but the fact that you're sharing this information from Mexico City right now just shows you the global reach of the ways that we can have conversations in ways that would have been unheard of in the, in the past. Joel? And then I need to move on after that, just mindful of the time. Okay, is it technology at large or just social media? The question is about. <laughs> I wasn't sure, but for social media specifically, I think as Terry, I was going to make that point, but she already made it. It's a tool. It, it depends on how you use it. And I, I work really hard to use mine mostly positively. I have my weak moments, but it's efficiency that I love. So I have a lot of people that I care about and I will not contact them individually on a weekly basis. There's not logistically impossible or to know that they have you know had a baby or had cancer or any of that stuff and so I think it's fantastic for that um, staying in touch but also just the efficiency of it and then as far as technology in general I think it's just incredible to see all the people who have sometimes been left out in society are being included more because of technology whether social media or other forms of technology. Right, not all negative. There are really certain positives. I can, I can go in and like your Facebook post of your hikes and or what you had for lunch that day. Um, so yeah, all these other kinds of things can be used for that. But uh, it's really this kind of idea that this has changed so much. And perhaps a lot of the rumblings that we're having is because the world has changed so much, we haven't even learned how to use this technology. But the question is, is how does this Silicon Valley technology and I'm using that as a euphemism for the technology itself because so many of these companies are headquartered there. How is that affecting us uh, from a morality? And before I talk, get in that discussion, I want to kind of come back to kind of a simple framework. This is uh, sometimes we make things so uh, easy to digest that you could easily poke holes in it, but it's just trying to give a framework. And that's the one from Marvin Harris. Marvin Harris is the guy who was an anthropologist culturally introduced us to these topics right here. And according to Marvin Harris, there, uh, that human life is a response, he said, to practical problems of human existence. That's his take. He was an anthropologist. That human life is a response to the practical problems of human existence. He said we had three kinds of responses. The first is that we are all together as our earliest tribe, all trying to survive, that we built an infrastructure. Right, that infrastructure responded to the resources around us in, in our area. What kind of foods grew there? What animals migrated through there? Uh, what was the climate like in there? What's the weather? Is it cold or icy or hot or warm? Uh, what technologies have we developed? That's the part of that infrastructure that allowed us to kind of exploit those things. And then once we figured out that, we looked at the demographics, how many people lived there, what was our health rate, and our things like that. And I, he said that, and his way of thinking, that was kind of the first thing that we did, is that we got together and we developed kind of cultures and practices and used information around the infrastructure of, of itself to make sure that we could provide ourselves with a house, food, clothing, all those things, protection and all this kind of stuff. As we develop those technologies, as we get bigger, we discovered that we needed to set up some social structures. What are the laws that are going to govern that? Who's going to have access to this? What are the rules about uh, sharing and things like that? What policies do that? How are we going to police this once we set these things on? And how do we kind of ensure that everybody uh, is, oh, there, that's nice and big. Uh, that everybody can do this, and what war do we have to wage against other people who may be inviting us in order to, to preserve what we have and make sure it goes in there. And then he says, only after that did we develop many of the justifications, Marvin Harris said, for why we do these things. We came up with religions that say, oh, this is why the world is in this order and the structure that it is. We came up with ethical systems, which and things like that that we valued, he thought, which is in order to preserve this and our sets of beliefs. Now, his famous book on that was to study of literally the sacred cow, the Brahmin cow of India, and how this started uh, from an infrastructure, social structure, uh, and a superstructure. And of course, a lot of people have, have attacked this idea, but it kind of gives you an idea of some of the things he was thinking about. 
He said this has the most power of all, the infrastructure. If we do not have the technology or the resources, none of these things really matter. And in fact, if we think about our ethics today, the people who wield most of the infrastructure, the people who have the, most, the biggest wield over that, in a way are the people with the loudest voices. It determines our capitalist system, our, our, our dependence on fossil fuels. All these things, in a way, depend or shape our social structures and even our beliefs, our rationalizations and justifications. And the struggle we have as ethical people is to take just our ideas and beliefs and say, this needs to change. When this is so much bigger, so much powerful, with so much force, it's almost impossible, Marvin Harris, to say, unless you can change this first. All right? That's my whole feeling as a biocentrist, that I need to change this in order to impact this. Now, you may may disagree with this, and it certainly I could understand the reasons for that myself because I've also thought of those things. But you can understand how uh, it's not the, the idea that we just need to go out and tell people don't do that, and yet our entire economic system is built completely on the things that we say are not that important, you know, or do it that way, right? Our fossil fuels, the wars that we go into, the things that we do. No matter what our beliefs are, we're still driven by our infrastructure, Marvin Harris would say, not the other way around. And that's the difficulties of it. When the, many of these information technologies just got started, they were involved in what we call greenfield technologies, which means how can we communicate with one another rapidly? There really wasn't an infrastructure for that. Uh, for, the, for those kinds of stuff. How can we watch videos of cats playing in the afternoon uh, to, to, for entertaining? How can we keep track of our neighbors, how, of, it, uh, of it, our friends and things like that, and let us know what's going on? Uh, many of those things of social media platforms got developed uh, in what are called green fields that no one else was really doing that work. And these early technology companies rushed in to fill uh, basically empty spaces and create new forms of technology. We do things now on our phone which makes, which we can't even believe. How many of you, the last time you have looked at a map to navigate your way to someone's home or someone else do? Or how many of you in this room, given even that we're an older crowd, how many of you use your smartphone to navigate now? Look at that. That would have been unheard of years ago. Yeah. I get lost more now. I get lost more. <laughs> right, turn this way. <laughs> that's what happens. Because <laughs> it's said to turn that way, and that's the way. I do that all the time. Your roads, like, turn here, and, and by the way, there's an exit two seconds later, and then an exit. I really would have known that. Um, anyway, it's like tri driving in Lisbon, New Jersey. Oy. Oh, no. so, <laughs> so all these things. Uh, so for... To a certain extent, that is great. That's the great part of technology. It filled a need that we, we had, but no one else was really doing that. But now look what is exactly happening, is that Silicon Valley, the technologies that have come out from there, not just those companies, those technologies, allow people to disrupt the infrastructure in other areas and ways that people never imagined. For example, how many of you have ever used Airbnb? Right? You went around the local taxes, you went around the local policies and the rules often, and were able to secure a business in another area to do that. How many of you have used Uber or Lyft or any version of that, right? To allow you to go around local taxes sometimes, allow you to move, navigate, and impact an entire social structure uh, in another place. How many of you have ever bought anything from Amazon? Right? How many of you have used Zoom to go into work or to do other kinds of things and things like that uh, without having to use a local building? The city of Norfolk I'm into has these giant, massive buildings in downtown Norfolk, and the businesses that are going there go, ah, eh, we can do everything online. Well, think about all those businesses that built themselves around the maintenance of those giant buildings, the restaurants, the bars, the, the delivery companies, all of that infrastructure has now been doing that. And it's going more and more and more, right? What the technology is allowing is for people to go in and change the life of people far, far away from where they even are, and actually to glean the wealth from that area and then bring it back to one location, to Silicon Valley, hence leading to the $4 million homes. Now, I don't mean this in a negative way. This is just how our system works. Can people think of other ways in which the, the technology is disrupting our infrastructure in other areas. 
Yes, sir. All right. You can have four people in a room who are not interacting with one another because they're all on their phones doing something in some other space, some other, some other part of the world. Yeah. It's really disruptive. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's both disruptive and good. It's good that we can do that, but it's also that we're not necessarily going into that same place in the ways that we had, had done before. Yes, uh, Joe? Okay. I was going to say accountability for um, organizations and systems that didn't necessarily have it before, like police, but also uh, like medical organizations, which may not be helping people as much as they should and things like that. Yeah. In fact, what's being complained about, about a lot of small town America is that everything can be done through Zoom now, or you could do it through technologies that have this made it good or bad. I'm not saying what these technologies are one way or the other. But good or bad, even in a small town in Texas, uh, which is I'm from, my friends are doing things in ways that they never would have had to do locally. You can even hire dog walking apps. You can do all these things in which we can interrupt the kind of the necessary flow of the infrastructure as it once was. On the personal level, it has interfered because now everybody, it's so easy for you to get in touch with everybody. People call you when you haven't, when you, you significant other, they don't like it because you're always on the device. Yep. In fact, the technology has gotten to such a place that what the term you often hear in Silicon Valley is that it's a good thing to be a disruptor. Do you know what the term disruptor means, right? That's where you can go into another business and completely disrupt it with a far more efficient way to do it but that may be based on one or two cities that have access to the technology or to the digital divide that allows them to do that. And once again, if you're with Marvin Harris, the, the infrastructure changes and impacts the social structure in this way. It goes this way, not this way. How might that be driving us in conversations that we're having right now uh, uh, about those? Let's take the social structure for a second. How many Americans now trust voting machines? Now, this is a crazy thing. You want to explain to people that this is a, a, a computer that's plugged into electricity, not even hooked to the internet. But because people know how that is actually possible, people are now going into other areas and disconnecting these things and saying that, no, some group somewhere is disrupting the dem democracy in our own area. Can you think of other ways in which people might, uh, that it's in impacting our social structure? Kurt, we do have a couple of hands on Zoom. Great, thank you. Let's take some comments online. Go ahead, Sandeepa. Please unmute yourself. Uh, thank you so much. I was thinking uh, it's an interesting idea that you start at the bottom, the infrastructure and how it affects uh, the top levels. Uh, and I was thinking, and, and time will show. So one thing that has happened because of technology, you're right at the local level, a lot of infrastructure has suffered. But the good thing, that may happen is it has allowed people to work remotely and they are moving out into smaller towns. So this whole concentration that was happening in the big cities leading to poor quality of life, it's, it's making people move out. And hopefully it'll over time, if it's sustained, may create more uh, spread of wealth. And these smaller towns and cities which may not have been thriving can potentially get to thrive because people are now living there and you know investing there and building lives there. So I was just thinking of the other side of it. Yeah, uh, not all good and not all bad, but certainly it allows for the decentralization of uh, wealth and practices in some area that people can move in there, but maybe they're doing jobs remotely. They're working in New York City, but they're sitting in, uh, somewhere in New Jersey, far, far away from the city, and it still allows them to do that work. So they're still participating in the economy. To what extent the local economy is benefiting that only that person shopping is hard to say. But 
Now, with the way we have the technologies, I can exist anywhere and work for a company in a far different place, and, and my taxes and all those kinds of stuff uh, are not necessarily distributed the way because I'm not spending necessarily the money locally. Not to mention the fact that all the technologies that we may have been dependent upon in our area have been disrupted as well, right? The technology, artificial intelligence, allows these things to continue to get better and smarter, to share information wildly across the planet, and have changed even how we access resources and things like that. Another one online, it's like, Terry? Uh, yeah, I think an underappreciated innovation for social justice is the police body cam. We now see on YouTube what only some of us saw before, um, and it was very, it's very eye-opening. Yep. And that's all. You broke up a little bit just because of the reception there, but it's the, the impact of even of the body cam, is that what you're saying? To make sure I got that right, Terry. Uh, the police body cam. Police body cams, so that we can instantly see what's going on to a certain extent. That is a benefit of the social structure to, to allow us to see what has formerly been hidden or people have said about, but, but we never did. Uh, Ron and then Susan. Microphone. Ron, <laughs> sorry about that, Jeff. Sleeping at the switch here. One thing we can't uh, uh, overstate is the effect on the uh, climate in Southern California uh, that being able to work from home has, uh, 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 has caused. Uh, my son used to drive an hour and a half each way to work in his car, and an hour and a half back, and that was three hours of driving with uh, fossil fuels being released into the atmosphere. Uh, my daughter-in-law used to have to take planes to go visit her clients all over the country. She's not traveling uh, two-thirds as much now as she was before, which reduces, you know, uh, fossil fuel pollution as well. Plus the fact that uh, uh, the, the highways in L.A. are much, are much better off now. Sure. Yeah, it's much easier, much, much easier, to, having lived in California too, much easier to drive down the road. Unfortunately, somewhere out in Simi Valley or somewhere in California is a gigantic super cooled air conditioning water sucking data storage container which is holding on to that but yes it's still much better than the maybe the fossil fuels coming from vehicles uh i think you're talking about social so, um, structure and the body cams on the police but the the zoom hybrid sessions in schools opened people's eyes up uh to teachers and things like that good and bad yeah, because one of the things that it gets to the other piece of that, one of the things that impacted youth is that whole socio-motive learning, that we are a social species. And the fact that we need to get together, to work together, to cooperate together, to make rules together, to make good governments together, is also being disrupted by the fact that any of us can live anywhere and work with a totally different people who are not even living in the, lo the locale that we are right there. And these are the kinds of ways in which these are being impacted, which brings me then to my final question about the, the superstructure. How does that impact our ethics and things like that? Uh, I think it's just striking that Elon Musk, when he finally purchased Twitter, the first thing he did, of course, is share a, 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 a meme, a social story about Paul Pelosi, which was not even true. Right, And it just shows you that it didn't matter. You finally have enough money because you're heavily involved in the infrastructure, like the old robber barons of the day who set the highways and the, the railroads in this country and designed us. That was the kind of thing that dictate the type of information we're sharing. So I just want to bring this to, to, a, to a close here. I'm sorry, Mark. Run one second. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, I was wondering, like, we we're talking about all the positive things from this new infrastructure and some of the negative things. So one of my, my question was also then, it seems to me there's a lot of new opportunities to, to deal with the deficits for these problems, to create community locally, to create businesses or things that can get people bricks and mortar or bring them together. And um, the other thing is about the Internet. You would wonder that now that there's, we were talking about the line 
and uh, facts. And it seems to me it's very asymmetrical and it's much more different than in the past because the information is so large and it's much more difficult to prove facts than lies. So the asymmetry of the situation is magnified exponentially and it's much harder to get it, obviously, to get information because to know if something's true or not, you have to do research, but you can put out so much there. So I was wondering that maybe they need to create standards for um, these uh, new, these these uh, channels uh, online that there has to be some kind of criteria for when you make a statement that it has to be represented as either uh, a fact and, and you can only say it if you have evidence to prove it or you have to really discriminate or whether it's not but you shouldn't just be allowed to claim things without <laughs> qualifying it as being an opinion. Right, so that's what Elon Musk is suggesting that what is it for $30 a month, how much is it? $8. How much? $8, Eight dollars a month. You can get a blue check mark next to your name, which means they know who you are and you're verified and those kind of stuff. But it still allows large numbers of people uh, spread across, a sprinkling of people from across the United States to have access to the technology to put out large amounts of information, which have brought us into lots of turmoil as well. So I leave you with this question, ethical people, about how we impact this. The technology is a good thing. Technologies tend to be as well but they have big impact on as well. If we're just going to come out and say, thou shall not do that, how really is that really changing this? And Marvin Harris said, yeah, you may have some cultural ability and magic that allows you to shift the infrastructure, but not unless you're addressing these other things as well. And that's the complexity we have here, and that's what I wanted to bring you to this day. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kurt. Thank you. Wow. Eight dollars a month for, for for a blue verification badge sort of sounds like selling indulgences, doesn't it? That's right. <laughs> well, uh, at this point, I want to thank everyone who made Kurt. Thank you, first of all. But I want to thank everyone else who made this possible. At one of for our greeters and ushers, uh, Edna Berkovitz and Amy Bly, certainly our musician uh, Ellen De Pasquale. Our Zoom coordinator, Eric Sanhusen. Thank you, Eric. Um, hybrid and sound, David Bland. Thank you, David. Um, our hosts for the morning, largely our host, that would be Ginger Gordon, who baked the wonderful banana bread that we've tasted. And now, uh, thanks, everyone. And now it's time for uh, announcements and collection. One of the beauties of getting together is that we can give together. So please do. Announcements? Uh, Ed. Yeah. yeah, it's a pleasure to Thank be you. here in person to make the announcement this morning, just to, uh, from the membership committee, to welcome you all here. A lot of uh, familiar faces in front of me, but online I see some people who are, who are new to me, perhaps newish to the society, so I want to encourage you to come back and back and back, whether you can visit us in person or on, on Zoom. We're happy to interact with you and uh, hope you'll uh, take the time to get to know us better. Look us up on, on uh, our website if you haven't done that yet. And uh, uh, maybe one of these days, depending if you're in Mexico City or closer than that, you might want to drop by the society and we'd be happy to see you here. Thank you, Ed. David. Thank you, Jim. I'm David Bland. I'm the administrative director and a longtime member. And I have two genuinely important announcements. The first is that on November 20th, we have our fall membership meeting. Now, normally, the major reason that we have that meeting is to pass the, 20, the next year's budget, the 2023 budget. And we will do that. There'll be a presentation on that, and we'll take a vote on it. But in addition, we're going to talk about a couple of other important issues, one of which <coughs> is to rename this event a platform to something else. So if you come to the fall membership meeting, we will discuss that. And following the meeting, there will be a poll sent to all members to vote on that. And that will all be explained at the fall membership meeting on November 20th, right after the platform. And everyone who's a member will get an al a notice in their email at 1 o'clock today with that agenda. And I know there's a couple of members on who are in the call but dialed in who don't really have um, full access to email, and you will get it by 
snail mail, if I may use <laughs> that term, U.S. mail. The second announcement is that we have a really exciting event. The Society is co-sponsoring a, a movie at the Teaneck International Film Festival, also on November 20th, but that will be at 5.45 p.m. It's called Julia Scotty, Funny That Way. This is a, <coughs> excuse me, a, a very warm uh, documentary about a trans comedian who transitioned from male to female. She had been on television as a, uh, as a man, later transitioned and was in America's Got Talent and explained the whole situation. It's a terrific um, documentary. Uh, and it will be followed by a talk back with the producer and with Julia Scotty herself. And Julia will do a show. She's a stand-up comedian, and I can tell you she uh, really is quite good. So tickets are available for $8. I'm going to pass out a flyer to the people in the room. I'll put some information in the chat window. If you are going to go, let me know, and I will make sure that we can all see to get, sit together. At, and it will be at Temple Emeth, not here. I see that we have Sylvia Acosta, oh, the chair okay. of our uh, Ethical Enrichment Committee. Go ahead, Sylvia. Unmute yourself. There we go. Hi, everyone. So good to be here today and listen to Kurt and hear all your thoughts. Um, so we're coming back full force now. Uh, ethical eating will happen on the 13th in the meeting house. Yay! 1.30, November 13th. Um, I and think we're going to do it at 1 o'clock. So oh, 1 o'clock. I'm sorry. So Lauren will be back. She just had her baby, but she was raring to come back and eager to share more delicious uh, vegan, planet-friendly recipes with us. On the 14th at 7.30 on Zoom is Conversemos with Javier hosting some informal Spanish conversation. It's lots of fun. Do join us. Um, the links uh, are available through um, our private Facebook page. And um, you can also reach out to, to me if you would like to join us for Conversemos. Um, I believe uh, the, uh, perhaps Susan's going to say more about this, but um, Susan has gotten uh, together an open mic to happen once a month, uh, the third Friday of every month, and it's going to start on the 18th. It'll be from 8 to 10. Come share your music, your spoken word, your poems, anything that you would like to share here in the meeting house. Okay, thank you. Say it again. Susan, you want to add anything to that? You want to add anything, Susan? It's an in-person event only, so it's not hybrid, so it, you need to be here. You can be here and not perform also. You can be the applauders, so thank you. <laughs> I'll be there. Thank you. Okay, anybody else on Zoom? Anybody else in the room? Well, do you have anything to close it out? Okay. Um, um, thank you very much for that. I'll bring the closing words to us. I went to go see Paul Taylor. Uh, one of the things I discovered when I came to New York is modern dance, uh, not something you get to see in South Texas much. Uh, thought it was stupid the first time I saw it, and then fell in love with it the first time I saw it. And I've just been addicted to it ever since. You've got some of the most renowned, of course, dance troops in the world here in New York City and these abilities. So we had to go see Paul Taylor. It's one of my favorite at Lincoln Center. Go see it. It's fantastic. You can get tickets as cheap as $15, which is pretty good. They're, they're making a commitment to make it affordable to everybody now. $15 for the opera, by the way. Uh, so you need to get out there and, and support the arts. They need our help as well. Uh, had one too many gin and tonics and then enjoyed the show and then got on the subway heading back uh, to catch the ferry back to where I live and saw this piece of poetry written on the wall uh, late at night on the subway, you probably have seen as well, called Passage. Every leaf that falls never stops falling. I once thought that leaves were leaves. Now I think they are feeling in search of a place. Someone's hair, a park bench, a finger. Isn't that like us going from place to place looking to be alive? Thank you, and have a lovely day, y'all. It's hard to turn the thing off. That's terrific. 
Thank you. And now the meeting house, I believe, is going to drop off of the Zoom meeting. But those of us who are on Zoom are welcome to stay and continue to meet and chat and enjoy each other's company. Hey, y'all. How you doing? How's the uh, you guys settled in there in uh, Mexico City? Oh, uh, yeah, we're getting settled in. It's a nice place. We have a nice uh, Airbnb. It's very comfortable. The internet has been great, except for about 90 minutes this morning before platform went out. So, <laughs> oh, yeah. Bit, yeah. But, but generally, it's a really nice neighborhood in, here in Mexico City. We're, we're very comfortable. The one thing that uh, worries us a little is, you know, the whole thing about Americans that have to be very wary about drinking the water in Mexico City. So we're trying to figure out how extreme we have to be. We know we don't drink it out of the tap, but do we wash our dishes with it? Do we take a shower? You have to take a shower. So far, it's been about four days. We're, we're doing okay. And that's just a function of like the, the, the bioflora in the, in the water, right? Your, your body's not used to it. Obviously, people who live there drink the water and, uh, and are okay. It's, it's just a sort of an adaptation, correct? Well, I, don't, I really don't know. I can't, get, I can't get my arms around that because apparently an awful lot of locals also drink purified bottled water. You know, they deliver, you've seen them in the U.S., these big, you know, 20 liter things of water that they, you put into a water cooler. Those right. are pervasive, they're everywhere. So um, it's not clear to me, you know, if you can, if the locals drink the water, the tap water also. I don't, I'm not sure that they did. So anyway, it's interesting. It's, it's a very nice neighborhood. It's a sprawling city. I mean, coming in, you know, it's up at about, I don't know, 7,000 feet or something like that. And it's in a sort of a caldera surrounded by higher mountains. And uh, which is, it's good and bad. It's sort of, my understanding is it's sort of built on loose ground because of the nature of the way the volcano, the former volcano here filled in. And that's why it's very prone. One reason, I guess, it's very prone to earthquakes. It also attracts the smog. So the air quality often isn't very good. And it's just a, such a huge, sprawling city to see it from an airplane. It's really quite something. So what's your what's your uh, your your main destination for your next walkabout, or what 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 are you looking forward to seeing there in particular? Well, we're going to head back to the Walmart grocery store again today. <laughs> oh, I've heard it's I've heard it's marvelous. I've heard it's really one to one to see in Mexico City. Actually, I have heard that. But <laughs> well, unlike in the U.S., the few WalMarts that I visited in the U.S., if they're like a superstore, part of the store is a grocery store. For produce and the one that's near us here is only produce you know i mean well produce mm -hmm. plus the things you would find in a shop right at home but it doesn't have all that other kind of walmarty stuff there's no clothes there's no lumber there's no garden center it's really just a grocery store but I'm, what i think it was a grocery store and uh, it's it's going to be our one of our lifelines i think but also there's the small local markets no, Terry just made a homemade quesadilla. Muy bueno. Gracias. No, she took it away. <laughs> well, you thought she made it for you. I did. I <laughs> slipped in and slipped out. So, anyway, we've been here about four days. It's, you know, so far so good. Thumbs up. That's good. Well, I'm glad you had safe travels there and hope. Uh, I'm sorry we didn't get together at the end of it. I know. I know you guys were like super, super busy and hope, hopefully you were able to, you know, tie up all your loose ends here yeah, in by the, County. By the skin of our teeth. You know, we did get a big down. Uh, we don't have an apartment as you know. So everything's in a storage unit. We had, a, we had set ourselves a goal as a, for a big downsizing in a storage unit. And we were able to finish that. So we're going from like a seven by 10 unit to a five, less than five by five unit to save some, you know, some cost. So we were able to accomplish that. We sold our car about two days before we left. So that was done. That was an interesting experience to sell it to cargurus.com, but it worked. So yeah, we got most of what we wanted to do done. Not, not 100%, but most of it by the skin of our teeth. That's pretty good. That's pretty good.
I was, I, you know, I was expecting you to put in a plug for uh, Erin's show. Uh, right? Is that this afternoon? Her doesn't she have a opening? She, this? I think she does, but I'm not related to her. We haven't had the same last name, but we're not relations. Oh, I thought you were for some reason. No, no, no. Well, we've we've checked, or I, I didn't check with her, but I checked with her with Richard Carr, who happens to be the same name as a as a brother that I had. He died when he was very young, but but we we can't see any relationship. I had. Them. Okay, I'm sorry. I did not realize that there was no. I thought somehow there was some, you know, relation, but I guess obviously there, not. Maybe, but we couldn't identify it. Okay. All right. Well, someone with your last name is going around doing art shows. Yes. Yes. <laughs> that's. Uh, anyway, that's that's uh, at uh, up at the. Uh, Union Art Center in Sparkle. Nice place. Oh, that is a nice area. Yeah. yeah. If, you ha if you haven't been there, if you're in the area, I definitely recommend it. Yeah. I'm sorry, where did you say it was? It's at the Union Arts Center, which is in Sparkle. I don't know how you pronounce it. I don't know if you pronounce it Sparkle, New York, or Spark Kill, or Sparkle. Uh, it's oh, okay. okay. Spark Hill, New York. I hear it as Spark Hill. Spark Hill, yeah. Because Kill is a word that has to be for. Right, for a river. Yeah. Something like that, yeah. Right. So anyway, nice, lovely place. Really great, great spot. Well, my case would be as calm as I think I'm going to drop off. Gloria, are you, are you saying something? You're on mute, Gloria, if you're saying something. Bye, Ken. Bye, Terry. Great to see you guys. Bye, Ken. Bye, Terry. Adios. Concert at the library, as Jean said, this afternoon. Oh, the concert is at the library, yes. And I'm walking a little bit slowly because I'm on the floor. So oh, no. About a little over 10 days ago. No, oh, I'm sorry. And it was just a freak thing, I guess the knee gave way. I didn't have the cane with me, I was in the house. And I went down, I knew I was going down. But I have a machine up in that bedroom, like a Nordic track. <laughs> and when I finally went down, the finally the head came down and it hit. Oh, I'm sorry. You all right? You okay, on, the, on the mend? I had four staples in my head. Oh my goodness, I'm sorry. And I figured I better not drive to the hospital, I better call a taxi. And I knew I needed a CAT scan because I hit the head. And they did all that and everything was fine. And yesterday they took the staples out. Okay. So, but now I walk very carefully with the cane until we see how things go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, I'm glad you're on the mend. Yes, I feel fine. I gotta get to the concert. Good. Thanks for joining us, Sandeepa. Nice to see you. Thank you. Thank bye you, bye. everybody. Bye bye. Well, Gloria, if, you know I'm right around the corner. If you need any help at all, so don't hesitate. Well, I was able to call a taxi. I figured it stopped the bleeding, but I figured maybe it's not wise to drive. I should call a taxi. Yeah, yeah. Well, I appreciate that you, you know, got blood in the taxi rather than in my car. But... <laughs> I got blood on the carpet, though. <laughs> but, but seriously, please don't ever hesitate, because you, you, the uh, others might not, might not know this, but, but Gloria and I live right around the corner. We're like two houses away from each other. Oh wow, wow! I just want to be able to get a haircut. Oh. <laughs> I don't do anything with my hair other than wash it, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I'll be able to go. Good. Well, I'm glad you're doing well. Thank you. All and right, I'm gonna I'm gonna head out. Everybody, enjoy your day. Bye. Bye, Sylvia. Bye. Good to see you. Good to see you. All right, I think I'm gonna head out to Benoit's. Carol, Teresa, great to see you. Have a wonderful day.